Hey, man, how's it going? It's going good. How are you? Not bad. Uh, this week on 95 Mac Happy Hour, we are going to talk a little bit about Apple Car, a lot about some new iOS 14.5 features, and some uh, Apple Glasses rumors, and then some Apple TV Plus uh, stuff has come up this week. Um, so let's start out with the uh, developer transition kit update. We, we spoke How about are we this. talking about this again? This is hilarious. <laughs> yeah. I mean... <laughs> I, I broke the news to you about how like you know half-hearted the deal was, <laughs> and and then you you broke the, the story to me on on uh, how they fixed it. So, what 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 are the details there? Yeah, like you know, there was a very muted response, I think, to the DTK thing. And and look, we you know we're privileged people to even get the developer in the first place or to be able to afford it, right? Uh, but everyone was based on the precedent of what they did for the. Intel to uh, for the Power PC to Intel transition, where when the DTK went back, what got replaced was an iMac of equivalent value, and then this program comes along. Obviously, they never promised it, right? So I, you can't get too mad, right? They you said that the the, the, the transaction was stated. You pay five hundred dollars, you get to use this thing, and then we want it back. Done. But there was like you know always that oh what they're going to offer as a nice little bonus, a nice little thank you. Yeah. And what we got slapped with last week was a two hundred dollar credit that you had to use by the end of May which just feels terrible. Like, especially as, and not me, I'm because uh, I didn't actually get any M1 compatible stuff out yet, but a lot of developers that do get that kit, they're the most dedicated people in the community. They're rushing to support, you know, Apple's latest platforms on day one, often with the better quality apps as well, right? Just the better, you know, just the better quality developers are the people getting that kit. And they're like, you're coming off Apple's biggest quarter ever. And what do they give you? They give you a $200 credit on something you paid $500 for and you got used by the end of May. Before uh, WWDC. Before WWDC, before any of the cool rumored stuff actually comes out. And it's yeah. like, do you want to get this MacBook Air that you might have already bought? Well, I- I- incredibly, they actually had a change of heart. I can't believe they actually changed the mind on this. But on uh, <laughs> February 6th, they sent out a new email. And the new email basically said, we understand, we heard you, and this is what we're doing instead. So rather than a $200 credit that expires at the end of May, now, all of us fancy developers can get a five hundred dollar credit, which is the same price as what we paid for the developer in the first place, and the credit doesn't expire until the end of December. So yeah. it runs through the end of this year. Better than you'll get a dream of. So now my forthcoming cool M one X six inch MacBook Pro will now be quote five hundred dollars cheaper because I paid five hundred dollars a bit last year. You, you prepaid a little bit. I prepaid, yeah. <laughs> Like and that's very good though, because it, it especially feels good. Like if they would have just done that, I'd been like, okay, cool. But because it was so half-hearted before, you know, it was uh, more than half the it was less than half the the value. Now it's like, oh, this really is a good value compared <laughs> because it was so low before. Yeah, now we feel great about it. And yeah. they also clarified that for people that have actually already bought M1 stuff and they don't need it, they'll be able to use the credit on any purchase in the Apple Store that quote helps them with development but i think it just basically means you can buy whatever you want with it you know so get you some airpods max could they, pay an extra 50 dollars and get some airpods max they, they yeah. really they help with development i mean they do a lot of things with them yeah definitely i'm gonna make uh, air buddy i'm gonna make an air buddy compare and go against rambo That's yeah I, i'm gonna make an air buddy sticker pack <laughs> <laughs> no but I'll, I'll be saving mine for the uh probably you know, three thousand dollars end up having to spend or whatever on the 16 inch mm-hmm. MacBook pro at the end of the year but no, uh, good good call like it's a nice. It's at least at least they're listening to the community, right? Like, mm-hmm. there's been quite a lot of, you know, roundabouts of, does Apple really care about the developer community? Do they only care about the big people? Do they only care about the people that are giving them subscription revenue every five seconds, or do they actually care about like you know the small people, the indie developers? And at least the fact that they saw this response and they did something about it, you know, it's got to make people feel good versus the kind of like sour taste in the mouth. Uh, mm-hmm. So I have indeed prepared the packaging as the email asked me to, and cool. now I await. My email to to send it back. Now you're ready. Are, <laughs> are you allowed to mail things in the UK right now? <laughs> uh, that is a good question, actually. Like <laughs> I know. I mean, technically, if they do a courier service, I can like drop it off at the door. If they expect me to go to the post office, then I guess I'll have to uh, negotiate with the British government that Indeed. sending back an M1 developer kit is uh, an essential service. Because you have until the end of the year to do this, basically. But, yeah. All right. Uh, oh, well, you, can, you have to return it promptly, I think. Like, you oh. get the voucher to use by the end of the year, but they want the thing back sent back 
soon. This should be this should be a reality TV, a reality reality show. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's planet. What is it called? Planet of the Apps. Planet <laughs> of the Apps. Yeah. Yeah. Here's season two. Uh, let's talk about some Apple Car stuff because we we spoke over the last few weeks about how Apple's talking with Hyundai slash Kia um, about manufacturing the 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 body of their car or just doing the do, making the apple car f- for being apple. the foxconn of the iphone but for the car project yeah and and hyundai was pretty chatty about it and then they were like we're not actually working with them um just really bizarre stuff uh it seems that there's at least reporting this week that that all talks between apple and hyundai slash kia have stopped you know we, we don't know if it's because of the the chattiness in the press or or what but uh just uh, this is all weird to me. Yeah, so I, like, say. I mean, maybe in the Steve Jobs era, if a company said something slightly too early, they get cut off and never spoken to ever again. But you know, Apple's a bit beyond the childishness of that nowadays. Like, if they remember, if, if, remember whenever uh, Apple was was reportedly buying Beats and it was going to be for three point three billion dollars. Yeah, it's three point two. Yeah. Yeah, three point two billion, and then it ended up just being three flat because of Dr. Dre's celebration video. Yeah, <laughs> I don't know if that was actually the reason, but that was like floated around as the reason. Yeah, yeah I mean it's good headcanon. Why not? Yeah, <laughs> you get a two hundred million dollar fine. Well, yeah, the three point so... six billion dollar investment that Kia's getting has just been halved. Now they're only mm. getting one point eight. <laughs> no, but that's obviously not how it works, right? Like, you know, Apple can't back down. Like, if Fox, you know, because Foxconn leaks stuff about the iPhone quite often like we see those internal presentations where they're like the iphone 12 is gonna have 5g and they have a do a little powerpoint slide for everybody and it leaks out and you know you, they never get repercussions of that stuff because they haven't got a choice like they have to and in, if apple wants u.s manufacturing of their car they only have a very limited number of options and if they've already basically signed the dotted line for a, you know a four billion dollar de- deal with hyundai they're not going to back out of that just because it leaked out to the press like, it's just unrealistic but i think what the truth here is because the news is basically like uh, Hyundai and uh, the affiliate Kia basically did a legal filing this week that said they had that they aren't in discussions with Apple on corporate into driving a car. Um, so that kind of like flattened the idea, right? Mm-hmm. Even though crazily, we were just talking. The reason it popped up and you know even on the podcast so much was like you know CNBC and Reuters were like saying is as if it was like a signed deal and it was going to be announced on February seventeenth. You remember that? Like, I do, so yeah. the fact that no, those massive publications uh, have yeah. got the wrong end of the stick, that's kind of crazy. But now I don't know what I'm going to do on that date. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, it's just a boring old February seventeenth now. There's no Apple Car announcement. Yeah. Like, I, I think, yeah. <laughs> I don't know what. I, obviously, Apple's going to be making a car. Like, or at least they're currently again looking to make a car. Based on this latest rumor, it seems like the enthusiasm, the hype train, is probably a bit premature. Uh, I think they're still going to do it, right? Like, but maybe it's not going to be announced in february maybe it'll be later in the year maybe they've you know found other suppliers they're negotiating with maybe maybe the high and i uh, and kia deal was like on the table but it wasn't like signed so then they've been looking around talking to some other people and now they like show you know maybe found someone else for instance uh so that's how i read it obviously it's like you know the automotive industry isn't our special specialty but just in terms of like the apple rumor sphere that's how i kind of see it but mm. like like as soon as there's a if, you, if you're in the anti-apple car camp as soon as there's a report that's like, oh, no, they're not doing the Apple car. Everyone's like, I told you so. This is the Apple television set all over again. They're never going to make one. It's just all, you know, flummery and made up words and, you know, Chinese whispers. Like, it's not real. I, I, you can't say that. Like, you know, we just talked about they hired the poor chassis, uh, head of, you know, head of body and chassis, right? Like, mm-hmm. they're building this team out and they're going to pro- be... Probably making- not to make the next iPhone. Yeah, they're going to be making hardware, uh, some hardware contribution to the car market at some point, maybe in five years, maybe in 10 years. And and as we still know, despite all this, there's the autonomous driving aspect is still way underway. Uh, there was that. Did you see the um, filing that they released with the California government that the number of hours, the number of miles driven uh, by the Apple car, you know, like prototypes, basically mm-hmm. uh, doubled over 2020. So they're obviously you know, ramping it up and their disengagement went down. So like they're getting there, right? And th- I assume they're trying to time it so that when the autonomous system is ready to go, it will be perfectly timed with the hardware being ready to actually ship the car. Mm-hmm. Yep. Um, and and uh, even though we don't have anything for February 17th anymore, based on that one crazy rumor, uh, the day after February 18th, the uh, next American Mars rover will arrive at Mars and land. 
so very nice. Yeah. So now that you've got that vacancy in your calendar, <laughs> next next Thursday. <laughs> All right. Do you want to take a uh, sponsor break here? Sure. This episode, thanks to our friends at Smile Software for sponsoring Happy Hour. Take your time back with the power of Text Expander. Repetitive typing, little mistakes, searching for answers. They're taking precious time away from you and your team. And with Text Expander, you can get that time back. Turn the things you type into reusable snippets that can be used again and again and again. Copy and paste, superpower. Get ahead of your productivity by taking advantage of Text Expander. It removes the repetition out of your work, so you focus on what matters the most. Save time and be consistent while you're at it. Text Expander makes it easy to give your team the right words for every situation, and they get it right every time. Whether you need to keep legal happy or delight customers with effective answers, you can rest easy in the knowledge that you and your team have got it covered and are giving people consistent messaging. Text Expander, you keep your team accurate and current with all the changes and the latest messaging for your business and brand. Share your text and images with your entire staff to keep them on track. And even as an individual, of course, you can use Text Expander's powerful shortcuts and abbreviations to streamline and speed up everything that you type. Just create a powerful snippet once, and then you can use the assigned abbreviation to let Text Expander fill it out and do the rest of the job for you time and time again. No more repetitive typing and no chance for human error. Text Expander works everywhere you type, Slack, Google Docs, email, web browsers, the lot. And you can install Text Expander on Mac, Windows, Chrome, and there's iPhone and iPad apps as well. Unlock your productivity with Text Expander. Listeners to this show can get 20% off their first year subscription. Visit textexpander.com slash podcast to learn more and sign up. Once again, that's textexpander.com slash podcast. Thanks, Text Expander. Uh, iOS 14.5, we discussed this last week, the, the software update that's in beta right now for developers and, and public beta testers. Uh, things like the redesigned podcast app, um, the ability to unlock your, your your iPhone with your Apple Watch on your wrist if you're wearing a mask. Very, very useful. Which but, last week you hadn't used because you didn't turn it on. Yeah, it's very useful when you turn it on. Uh, <laughs> it, it works it, pretty it, well though, right? Yeah, it works pretty well. Um, it's a little bit weird whenever it says that your watch is not close enough to the phone, even though mm-hmm. you're, you're holding your phone in your watch wrist hand. Uh, but uh, alas. Uh, but we still have new things to talk about in iOS 14 with 5, some, th- some new things that have been discovered. So let's begin with Spotify. What's, what's new with Spotify uh, as it comes to iOS 14.5? Yeah, so obviously the HomePod supported third-party music services on it natively, uh, very recently, right? And Pandora have adopted that. Uh, we're still waiting for others to do it, like Spotify. And then if you go back to iOS 13, uh, Apple added the SiriKit Media Intense, which let you control third-party music apps like you can do the, the Apple Music app through uh, Siri on the iPhone. Uh, but there was no facility in iOS 13 up to now to be able to specify, like, I don't want to use Apple Music. I want to use Spotify predominantly. So if you just asked a generic music request to Siri, like, you know, play Taylor Swift, it would always go to Apple Music. You'd have to explicitly say, play Taylor Swift on Spotify for it to instead route the request to the Spotify application on the iPhone, right? What now, Apple hasn't actually announced this as like a feature or a thing. It's just kind of turned up in the in the beta. So maybe it's like premature and they're going to take it out or they haven't, you know, they haven't decided it's going to ship yet or not. But what people have discovered in 14.5 is that when you interact with Siri for the first time after updating with music, it'll actually prompt you to pick a default music service. And what it does is it brings up a little list on the screen of, you know, Apple Music, Spotify, Pandora, all the, all the apps that uh, you have installed that support the Siri kit media intents. So all the apps that previously you could use via Siri by saying, you know, play this song on Spotify or play this song on Pandora, all those apps now appear on a little list as part of the Siri experience. It only happens one time. It's like, you know, choose your default music service. And so if you pick Spotify, from then on, when you just say a unqualified request, like play this album, play this playlist, play this, you know, artist, uh, it won't default to Apple Music anymore. It'll, It'll be as if you said on Spotify at the end of it. So you're basically getting a default music service uh, through Siri for the first time, which is pretty cool. Uh, it is also kind of strange. It just kind of popped out the blue. Like, it's like, oh, here we go. Like, oh, we we're not going to really announce it as a feature. I mean, already with iOS 14, they announced, you know, you can set your default web browser, a default email app, right? Mm-hmm. And yeah. they work to limited extent, but they do work. Uh, but, you know, they sneaked in here and offered it for music. The thing is, they could offer this for like every Siri kit domain, 
uh, you know, they, there's like messaging, reminders, mapping, mm -hmm. navigation. And so far in 14.5, it only offers you default options for music, which is a bit odd, but there you go. Yeah, I, I would love if it worked with the reminders domain with, with things so you could just use things as your reminders app. Uh, that would be on things every single time or two. Right, times. right, with, with things, you know, yeah. Uh, yeah, and, and also there's a really good example of this being used already with what Amazon does with Echo products in the Alexa app because you set the category for your uh, preferred music streaming service and your preferred music radio service. So you could say, I want my on-demand stuff to come from Spotify, but my streaming stuff to come, or my, mm -hmm. my radio and kind of algorithm radio to come from Pandora. Um, you know, I think it's probably more likely that you've got the same for both, but that's how far uh, the, the ecosystem goes. Um, it, 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 it's, it's an obvious next step to have some UI for this, especially so it's discoverable because it's kind of uh, how do you invoke it now? You just talk, you talk to Siri and then it you you ask it to use Spotify and then it then it suggests for you. Yeah, uh, basically, I think the way it works is the first time you update to four point five, whenever you next make a music request, it will say pick a default service and then okay. you choose it from the list. Or afterwards, you can like specifically ask Siri to change your default music service and then it will give you the options or at least it's meant to give you the options but yeah like you're right it's not very discoverable because yeah. if you if you choose apple music the first time and then you forget there's no like ui to change it with the web browser and safari stuff if you go in settings and you go on to safari it says like default browser and it says you know if you pick chrome or something instead as of the current beta if you go into the music app when you've selected like spotify it doesn't have any interface there to change it back so yeah they should definitely add that and if they're going to keep adding more and more of these like default preferences they need to like make a, a dedicated section of settings where it just has all this yeah. stuff listed and you can tweak it to your heart's content. Yeah, they have, they have a Siri settings section. Yeah. So and and yeah. by the way, I think this still has the same uh, limitations as the HomePod music thing where like, if you pick a third-party service, it will try and use that for podcasts, audiobooks, and music. Like, It only knows the, the, the audio domain. It doesn't have subcategories beyond that. So I see, okay. There's a bit of an issue there. Like, if you're using Spotify for music and podcasts, when it's fine, right? Or if you only ask for music through, like, personally for me, if I did use a, I use Apple Podcasts at the moment, but if I did use a third party podcast app and I wanted to use Spotify, it wouldn't actually bother me because I don't know. I never ask Siri to play podcasts. If you see, I always ask Siri to play music, but I never ask to play podcasts. So I don't know why that is. It's just the reality. Uh, it's because but, it's not reliable. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's probably that's, one of the reasons. That's how I got burned the HomePod. Was, yeah. Was, but you know what yeah. I mean, right? Like, it's, yeah. So it, it, you know, it's better than nothing, obviously. But ideally, down the road, they'd have like, you know, it doesn't need to be complicated. You just have every single category, and it says what app do you want to use by preference, and you can still use the other ones just by saying their name. But mm -hmm. It's a nice yeah. they've done it, and obviously, there's the antitrust thing having over here that this probably helps them assuage some of that criticism. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, something else that I, I I discovered this week with Siri is uh, I was on my motorcycle and I was um, using AirPods for audio navigation. And uh, Siri said over the AirPods, um, did you know, or you can now tell me about accidents along your route. And, and I was like, oh, okay, cool. So then I tried it in the moment and I said, Siri, there's an accident. And then Siri gave me the definition of accident and asked me if I wanted to read more. And I said, no, but it was, it, it's the, the voice activated version of this new user interface that's in Maps, and Maps has a little bit of a redesign in terms of the um, current. You're, you're now you're currently navigating screen. Um, I think everything's just, there's like more rounded buttons, and it's just, it's just tweaked a little bit. Um, but what they've definitely added in there is the ability to give feedback along the route to say there is a there's an accident in the head. There's a speed trap ahead, so that if you're going to come around the corner and there's a, a police officer, ta you know, taking radar, that you can mark that in the same fashion as what as what the app Waze does. And Waze it was independent, and then it was bought by Google, and so now it's a Google property. Um, Apple now has full control of their map data in, in, in many parts of the world, and so this is, I guess, just one more example of of where they go from from there by but owning their own data and um it's you know i i i, I don't expect it to be as, as robust as ways yet just because of the whole networking thing um i mean it's just debated right now but maybe you know come ios 15 ios 16 this is in the wild and other people know about it and the ability to do this 
with Siri is useful because I believe to do the, do the report an accident with Waze, you have to you know tap through the, through the user interface or make a Siri shortcut for it, which who does that? Uh, and so the ability, the ability to have it, <laughs> as a Siri, the ability to have it as a Siri command and say, "Hey Siri, there's a there's there's an accident ahead" is, is useful. Um, I, I once you get down the the wording the right way, because <laughs> I, I didn't quite do it for some reason. Yeah, so the, the categories that you can report for is accident, hazard, and speed check. That's what they call it. And so you've got a red icon, you've got a yellow icon, you've got a blue icon. Uh, you Like, this is cool, and it's great they're doing it, because, you know, that we've seen that when they control the data for their maps, they can offer better experiences, right? And they've delivered that with the raw map data, and if they can build on that with, you know, navigation and directions and smarter stuff there, um, it'd be great. But, like, there is a kind of social networking chicken and egg aspect to this where to actually like the reason ways is valuable is not because you can report accidents it's because other people report accidents right. and then it roots you around them right like so for this to work well this stuff actually has to be used people have to report it and so then when you go to uh you know do a map do a routing with siri on apple maps in the future it actually gives you a better route because it can be informed by the upcoming accidents or the hazards um or even like, I don't know. I don't know how they're going to fully expose this yet because this is just in beta for reporting. But like, because right. for stuff like hazards and accidents, yeah, obviously it's going to just like route you around them, right? Or that's hopefully what it would do. But for something like the speed check stuff, is it going to like? I guess it, I guess they have speed camera you, you, um, you, place markers yeah. on the map as of iOS there's, fourteen anyway. Yeah, there's place markers for speed for for tra- for speed cameras. And then uh, red light cameras, and then they also tell you like if you're actively navigating, Siri will tell you as part of your directions, um, red light camera ahead. <laughs> so yes, which is which I, I guess it maybe uh, I, I don't know that that Waze quite does that. I think Waze it has some it, of that. Yeah, it'll give you an alert. Yeah, it, it notifies you. Um, so, th- th- but this will be good once once it's actively you know, in, in a non-beta version of iOS and people are heavily using it. Do you, do you think it's out of character for them to offer you to, like, report speed cameras? Mm, it didn't send out to me. Like, because I feel like in the past, I maybe I've got the impression that that was the kind of thing Apple Maps was never going to do because, you know, Apple wants you to follow the law in all circumstances. But, I mean... Uh, if they're going to show you the speed cameras on the map, like, they might as well let you have user reported speed cameras as well. Yeah, I mean, like, what? What? <laughs> remember when Apple went head to head with the FBI over encryption? You know? I, yeah, I know this is different. It's just I'll, like a funny thing where yeah. it's like, because it's not an omission to like break the law, but it's kind of like this helps you break the law. Do you know what I mean? Like, it's it's a weird thing for like Apple's brand to have, but the reality is every other mapping app that has, you know, user contributed data, crowdsourced data offers the speed check stuff. So they couldn't not do it, right? Like it'd be maybe maybe it'll get pulled out of the beta and we'll hear a story about it. It was it was some rogue intern who included this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, like it'd be it's cool that they've added the reporting and then we'll have to wait and see how they actually like expose it on routes to mm-hmm. you know to actually be useful. Yep, that's right. Uh, and then the last thing that we've noticed this week and now it's 14.5 is uh, how fraudulent website warning uh, the setting works in iOS 14.5 because it, it's already there in previous versions, but how it behaves is different. Is that right? Yeah, so I barely remember the story, the background of this, because but do you yeah. remember, um, like, was it a year or so ago, there was a big flare-up that Apple was reporting web browsing uh hits to baidu in china okay and basically for the safe browsing feature this is existed for ages and it's on every browser right when you visit a website it checks against the database oh right right it, right yes yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. to see yeah. if it's like you know bad right or it's like a scam or whatever and if it's in the database it can show that alert on the screen instead of actually taking it to the website but to do that you know it had to do it, it it's it's somewhat unprivate right because it's basically having to send the the website that you're on to a third party to validate it and send you back the response. Now, it is more complicated than that because they like hash the URL and they only send parts of it. And, you know, they try and make it good. Uh, but at some level, you're sending every U- page you visit to somebody else. Mm-hmm. And this happens in the US and most of the world through Google's fraudulent safe browsing service. Uh, it's used by Firefox, I think. It's used by loads of browsers. It's used by Safari. And then in China, because Google is blocked in China, they use the Baidu version. 
Uh, and about a year or so ago, there was like a semi privacy scandal because it was like Apple sending every website you visit to China. You know that kind of that kind of story. Uh, what they've done in fourteen point five is they've basically taken the privacy protections to another level because now rather than Safari browser contacting like the Google service directly, it first contacts like an Apple endpoint and the Apple endpoint contacts Google or Baidu on the back end. So basically your IP address now no longer gets sent to Google or Baidu or whoever else they use for fraudulent search in the future. So it's slightly more privacy preserving in that way because your IP address is only ever getting shared to Apple because then they go and make the request for you for to Google and to thingy and thingy. So it is an improvement. And as they, you know, continue to tout, uh, you know, their focus on privacy and security, it should be their prerogative to do this wherever they can, like tying down the hatches in every in every single way. Like if you want to talk the talk, you've got to walk the walk. And this is a way to do it. All right. Makes sense to me. Do you think any other podcast, Apple Podcasts, podcasts with uh, AirPods Max every week? Talk about AirPods Max every week. No, podcast with. Podcast with AirPods Max every week. Hmm, that's yeah. a good question. Yeah. You're the yeah. only, so far, I, know, I, I only know that you're the one that does it. So, yeah, yeah. You know, I just wanted to mention it because it's every week I'm consistent here. All right, let's take a sponsor break. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we are sponsored this week by Express VPN. You know, when you search for something on Netflix and it shows up in the little like autocomplete thing, but the show's not actually there. The fact is Netflix has thousands of shows that it hides from you based on your current location. And then to just to make it even worse, it puts its prices up. If you want to get the most value out of subscriptions possible and see all the content in Netflix from all around the world, you can use ExpressVPN. Netflix in the US or the Japan or the UK where I am, it's different. You get different content libraries depending on where you are. But with ExpressVPN, you can virtually change your location and control what countries in Netflix that you want to watch. ExpressVPN has over 90 countries to choose from. So when you run out of stuff to watch in your own you know, US library, just switch around the country and unlock new shows to enjoy. So for instance, The Office left Netflix in the US at the end of last year. Well, you can just switch over to Canada with ExpressVPN and just keep watching Michael Scott. <laughs> of course, <laughs> ExpressVPN works with more than just Netflix. You can do the same kind of thing with other streaming services, like being to access the BBC iPlayer from the US, uh, the BBC iPlayer that you know I enjoy. ExpressVPN is super fast. Unlike some other VPNs, you can stream over ExpressVPN with zero buffering across your phone, laptop, and on the big screen with support for smart TVs and more. So stop paying full price for streaming services and only getting access to a fraction of their content. To get your money's worth, go to expressvpn.com slash happy hour. Don't forget to use our link so you can get three extra months free. That's expressvpn.com slash happy hour one more time expressvpn.com slash happy hour to learn more and sign up have you ever seen the american office because i know that, know that you've got your yeah own of course version. i've seen the american office i know you have your own version over there yeah the, i actually prefer the american office to the british one <laughs> cool all right good to know uh let's talk about dan riccio's secret project we discussed this whenever apple made their you know, vague, mysterious press release to say that, that Dan Riccio was no longer going to be with the VP of hardware, and he was now going to be working on a, a, a secret project. Uh, I think I think the guesses were, were were two things: you know, Apple glasses or Apple car, and then you can narrow it down and say, well, which one's more likely to happen? You know, sooner. Um, you know, it's not, and that's your guess. And uh, there's also, we, 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 you know, our, our former colleague Mark Garman at Bloomberg. He uh, had a report out this week that 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 reports on what it is, not just a guess, but but uh, based on reporting. So, uh, what is Dan working on? <laughs> According to Bloomberg, Dan Riccio is transitioning to oversee the AR headset, the AR slash VR headset. He's uh, on the team that's developing future Apple and VR headsets. There's obviously the rumor that there's going to be kind of like a developer version or a super high end, like $3,000 headset coming in 2022. Uh, you know, that's going to have super high resolution displays and it's going to be, you know, expensive. And But the idea is this will come out and then down the road, they're going to do one that is like actually what's going to be as big as the iPhone. So, you know, like the an Apple Watch or larger ambitions, like the $3,000 headset is not going to have Apple Watch ambitions. And, you know, that Bloomberg report from a couple of weeks ago said they aim to sell 
one per store per day or something so which is like two hundred thousand units a year which is like that, that that is cheaper than some of the original apple watch models yeah, that is true yeah <laughs> they're not going to come out with ar with the ar headset in solid gold i don't know AR, ar edition yeah yeah so uh bluebird says that apple is hitting roadblocks in developing its ar headset uh so and that's the first one so i guess Riccio, Riccio is going to you know, step back from his data responsibilities of doing all of Apple hardware engineering so he can help ship uh, the, you know, the developer, beta, prototype, whatever you want to call it, industry-focused one out the door. Uh, and then after that's done, be able to move on to get the, you know, the mass consumer one on the way. Yeah. Uh, it says that Apple has informed staff that they also transition in the group that's currently working on in-house displays and camera technology under Johnny Saruji's control. So Saruji is obviously the one that's managing silicon design and the the, the uh, team leader for you know the M1 chips, the A14 series, all of that stuff. And modems um, too, right? Modems, yeah. Currently charging processors and modems. Uh, we haven't yet seen the Apple modem come out, but that's obviously in development. That was last rumored to be coming like 2023, 2024. That's the hold up for Max getting cellular is... No. <laughs> Uh, if they wait to, if they really do wait till twenty twenty four to give you a say, Mac, that'll be the, the, the low traffic because it's like nothing in licensing fees because it's so so low volume. Yeah, <laughs> it's like, why wait? Yeah, like the goodwill of the M one architecture transition will have more than died out by twenty twenty four. Yeah, uh, but obviously that's interesting because they're moving under his domain. As the rumors that Apple are developing their own micro LED displays, right? Indeed. They're going to ship really custom displays, probably starting with the Apple Watch at some point. There's been on and off rumors that they've got a little like headquarters near, uh, near um, like a dedicated building near Apple Park where they're like growing because micro LED is like organic. So you're like growing the screens and then you work out to make one or two of them and it's like, oh, this is great. And then you've hit the problems of how do you make a million of them? So that's, that's kind of where micro LED is sitting at the moment. It's like you can make some in a lab and they look really cool and then. But how'd you get yields up to actually be practical? But mm -hmm. if that's going to reach his head, that probably means that probably signals that it's closer to being done. Because generally, a lot of the time, Apple like incubate something, and then when it's like getting close to prime time, they then go and give it to like the, the head of the the head of the group to yeah, go and actually uh, get. Otherwise, it. you're not going to waste that executive's time on something that's R and D. Yeah, like R and D projects aren't going to get that kind of attention, right? Mm -hmm, right. Um, I think we saw the same kind of thing with the Apple Watch or like the iPad, like um. Mm -hmm. the vps that they work on the iphone and as the ipad got close to ship they pick you know some of their favorite vps to go and head up the ipad project to actually get it out the door same with the apple watch uh, and obviously the same things playing out here where they are uh those inside apple hope that riccio's hardware expertise will help move past the issues that they're having but day-to-day -day work on the project is still being led by mike rockwell so he's still leading what uh Bloomberg describes as well over a thousand engineers working on the ar and vr headsets but they hope that Rich, that Riccio's influence is actually going to make a difference in getting the thing out the door. Uh, and finally, Bloomberg basically says that around last March, Riccio had handed oversight of many of many of his responsibilities already, like electrical engineering, product design, and project management for the iPhone, and most of Apple's other major products to uh, John Turnus, who John obviously John Turnus is now the, the SVP of hardware engineering. But it seems like this I, this transition has been long in the works, and it started last year, and now it's been formalized basically. Very cool. Uh, and and there is this, well, where, where are we in, in Apple Glasses? I mean, what, what's your timeline that you think or, where this is going to be more than just the, the $3,000 thing that we... Well, that we I think the here? problem with the, the real glasses, right, is that current technology can't make them. Like, mm -hmm. you just have battery problems. Like, if you want something to have a decent battery life like if you want to if you're gonna if you if you need a product that you're gonna wear all day long it needs to have all day battery is that the same problem with the apple watch right like and people complain about the apple watch battery life like there is a limit on how much stuff people are going to accept to be able to charge on a regular basis and the very minimum for all that glasses is you want to be able to wear them all day long like you can't mm -hmm. you can't wear glasses that you wear for like three hours and then put them in the charging it. case yeah, yeah, like, yeah that's just stupid like people because people uh, Obviously, if you don't need glasses to see, it's like, okay, you put them in your bag, but people are going to, they're not going to carry two pairs of glasses around. Do you know what I mean? Like, you're just going to need, they're going to need to last a long time, but to last a long time, you need bigger batteries, but then that means you kind of a slim and slender design, which then looks bad, so they can't be made, right? That's the current issue with the AI glasses thing. Like, 
the headsets is going to like hololens right and that's yeah. just a big thing that you know you look like a um a submarine controller with a you know the whole the, the mask on and everything like and that's fine if you're doing industry work or you're just playing games in the comfort of your own home although i don't i doubt that the three thousand dollar headset is going to be a big hit in terms of gaming at that price point uh just because it's so expensive right gotcha. uh, and uh, if you're trying to make a, a lifestyle ar glasses product not a headset there's a reason none of them exist right the closest you saw was like google glass but that wasn't anything close to an actual ar experience it was like a little screen that, that was in the it was a heads up display yeah, yeah heads up display yeah, yeah. It, the, the ar glass uh, the google glasses was like an apple watch that you could see by looking forward rather than looking at your wrist right mm -hmm. and maybe apple does ship a product like that sooner than anything else but that's not going to be like obviously what they want to do with like a proper AR, mixed reality ar experience so yeah i think i think the ar project is like still years away so when did um lynch join for the apple watch that was like 2012 2013 basically I uh think. I, well, I i it had to be after 20 13 because i started a 95 mac in, in april 2013 i think we both did and mm. and, and so lynch was after that so it's probably yeah. 2013 2014 basically and the apple watch shipped 20 no it's got to be more, longer than 2014 because the apple watch announced at the end of the year like yeah so it's got to be it's probably around 2013 probably sometime yeah. in 2013 so if, i mean if you work on the apple watch timeline you've got two more years but you can't just, <laughs> it's you can't, fair yeah but you can't just copy and paste that over to this because it's a good different different ball game right but yeah i think you've at least got two years let's put it that way <laughs> yeah um our, our friend uh uh chaos uh Tien Tien. On, on on twitter yeah a few weeks ago he sent me a link to a motorcycle helmet that i think in his words apparently works with carplay <laughs> and it, uh, the apparently is pretty strong there because I, w I looked at it and it's 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 called eye lights i ride and and the whole apple glasses thing got me thinking about this again um what it is it, it's a six it, it costs about 600 dollars us dollars um you add it to any helmet you already have and it's this whole system that there is like bluetooth and voice control and speakers which you can already do all those things with a helmet but it also has one of those little tiny you know, prism lenses that you mm -hmm. have, I guess, angled so that you can see through it as you're writing and project it on like that. Google Glasses. Exactly, like yeah. Google Glass. And they they work out in some way to project apps like Waze and Google Maps. And they even show <laughs> CarPlay projected. Um, no, I'm not so sure how they achieve that. Uh, you know, I, I know that there's aftermarket ways to have wireless CarPlay on an existing CarPlay system. And it's like it runs a version of, of iOS on that little dongle in, in a way that's not very trustworthy, but it works. Um, this thing, I, I don't have one to test it out yet, but it just the, the premise alone to have a heads up display like like this, so not not even AR glasses, but um, this thing that attaches to your, to your helmet is just you put your helmet on and then you can see, you know, with translucency, so you, th you see through it. But it's also on the road. There's that, um, and, and that's something that you can apparently buy today. I don't want to risk six hundred dollars on on trying to get it, but um, that's out there, and, and it made me think oh, this, this is a thing that would be useful for for you know the Apple glasses in the future. You know, definitely not the Hololens version, but but the long term goal. Um, because right now, when I'm navigating, you know, if you're in a car, you, you might not your phone or have an in screen. Um, in, in in your car screen, um, I mount my 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 phone on the on the handlebars, and that works out really well. But um, so, sometimes the phone's in my pocket, and I'm using the watch, and that's a little bit too far from my comfort zone. So this would be neat to have, and it certainly isn't the full CarPlay experience, you know. Um, and the other thing I, I, I stumbled upon today, and looking at looking for the first thing, the iLights iRide product, is something called Live Map, and it's still not really AR. I mean, it, it tries, what this does is it's a, it's, it's a full motorcycle helmet. So the first thing you put on your helmet of any type, this thing is the helmet itself. And it's got this, you know, projector built in the Google glass style and it overlays, I, I guess it looks at the road and it overlays lane guidance on the road. And that's this big thing. And it costs $2,500, which I found <laughs> So that was interesting to be a single application use of something like this. And then they promised availability in Q3 of 2022, so no, it's a bit, a bit of a while off. Then you could buy an Apple Car by that time. Uh, yeah, it's, it, 
it's so specific q3 you know usually you see like the first half second half or like q1 you know but uh say q3 (laughs) the the first half of the second half of the year we think we'll shift this thing um but that's what i hope they do on the apple car by the way when they eventually do make one like have the not just a heads up display but like you'd be a proper overlaid like so you almost get like a mixed reality ar experience projected onto the road with like yeah because i always talk about how we need it on the, the apple maps on the iphone where you get the little augmented reality thing to point you left and right which they still haven't shipped but they should totally do yeah like do that on the actual car and then maybe if you're like sitting in traffic you can like press a button and it zooms forward to the um what are they oh what do they call the google street view what's it called uh, look around look around yeah so you, you you know you get stuck in traffic and you just want to see where you're getting to you press a little button and then you know what you're looking at instead zooms forward and you can almost b- pretend like you're already there like that's what i want from the apple car it's got to be that cool like yeah i don't just a friend, want like, uh, like a, better. A, a friend a friend of mine has a bmw stv that projects out onto the road um we're not really under the road but just on, on the windshield and you see things like your your miles per hour and and Mm -hmm. i guess the idea there is that you don't look down at at the dash you just look ahead and you see those things but it's not obtrusive and it's just it's kind of a neat it's kind of a neat gimmick kind of a neat demo but um yeah i've seen that they're they're, you know as a parallel they're more like the google glass experience right where you get Mm -hmm. a little projection in the corner sure and then the real deal is like you know it can actually just inter it superimpose over anything on the on the screen like yeah it interacts with the environment yeah and the all the investments we're seeing them do in Apple Maps, whether it's their own map data, look around, car accident reporting, all of that stuff, that all feeds into the eventual car product, right? Like, I don't think they'd be half as interested in developing all these Apple Maps features if they didn't, you know, have hardware ambitions to actually ship a car in the future, because it's all gonna it's all gonna go in there, and you like they keep adding new new features to CarPlay, which is great, but all that stuff's gonna be rolled into like the actual Apple Car eventually. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yep, uh, and and on the topic of AR, uh, a couple of things with Apple TV Plus. So first, I published my review of For All Mankind this week. So I've seen I've seen all of season two. I can't say much about it except that I very much enjoyed it. And then you can read my review, review which has no spoilers, um, but just general sentiments about the season. And um, the bottom line for me is that if you like season one, you might have seen the trailer for it and thought this is going to be vastly different, but. The, the trailer is, is you know, it, it's an action trailer and the show is is a sci-fi drama. And so if you liked all the character development and interactions and, and stories in season one, um, you get that same thing, but, but you know, in 10 years later in season two. Um, so I, I thought it was very enjoyable. And uh, I got to do uh, some interviews. Can I ask the- you a question about that? And you, sure. you, you can, um, you know, if you're not allowed to answer, that's fine. But uh, mm-hmm. is there... Because the only thing I didn't like about Four of Mankind Season 1 is that quite a lot of it felt like a a drama on the ground, right? And it almost yeah. felt like it it was it you know, it didn't have to be related to space. It was just like family drama, right? Which yeah. is fine and it interweaves into a story. On season two, I know you're saying it's like, you know, the actions in the trailer and then it's a thingy, but is it still like family stuff or is it more like, you know, like space cold war battles? Do you see what I mean? Like even if it's just talking about it. I would I would say that there's as much like family drama okay. on the ground again but the the further they go into the show the deeper they're integrated within this is the space program these people work in the space program mm. and and that the drama is because of the space program not just because they're you know a family of of three or four um and 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 there's there's certainly more space because they're further along and in, in yeah their, like the trailer's I, got them like with guns walking across the moon like i want the moon conflict with the russians like big shoot out you know yeah yeah it doesn't, based I, on I, your I, description it doesn't sound like that's quite happened i would also say that uh, there's something i mentioned in, in the review um you know the, the cold war was largely tension building up of what's going what could happen with nuclear weapons <laughs> and that that didn't uh, and and it's kind of that the season is, is a bit like that too, where the, the right. tension builds up throughout the, the season. And then I also mentioned in the re- review that if there's one thing that I, I could critique about it, it's that um, it, it well a couple of concerns is if you do a ten year jump every season, are you really going to have the same cast every year? You know, and and the as you can see probably from the trailer, I imagine um, the way that the character Ed Baldwin is aged wasn't very. Uh, it, it it caught it, it took you out of the scene when he was you know had like fake gray hair and like way too dark of a tan. 
Uh, I mean, that's realistic, <laughs> but also it's distracting. Um, but so there's the concern of, you know, are, are the characters that we're following and care about now, are they going to be in future seasons? You know, we'll see. Um, and then the other thing is uh, because it is tension building up throughout the season and then near the finale, that there's, there's so much happening all at once that it, you definitely get payoff but it becomes hard to keep track of some of the things that's happening. You're like, you know, it could have, they, they, they don't spread it out across the show. It seems like there could have been like three or four arcs that they, that they had. And that's the season. Uh, and I said, it was cold war style buildup. It really modeled cold war, you know, as, as history. Um, but it's, it's nice. And in the first, this won't even be a spoiler you know, I can totally say this in the first, um, you know, a few minutes of the first episode, there's, uh, a, a newsreel montage is only in that first episode, but it's just very entertaining if you're a fan of history to see all the things that happen differently, including um, John Lennon nearly escaping assassination. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so it's 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 neat to see how many things are different. Um, and of course, in the series, uh, in the season, Ronald Reagan's president. I think in the in, it was kind of an undertone, but in in the first season. I think Ted Kennedy was president, which which never happened. He ran, but but didn't uh, wasn't elected uh, as president. And and now we're back to reality. Maybe the timing and the years are off, but then the events are what what gets shifted. But um, it's I, I also think it's it's you know you don't have to care about space stuff to really appreciate it. It's it's drama all on its own. Um, now that this year I know more about space stuff than I did a year ago when the first season was was available, um, and I picked up on some of the the Easter eggs, the trivia, um, you know, there's, there's things like uh, LC 39C being a launch, launch complex 39C. Uh, that's at Kennedy Space Center. There is one now as a 2015 for, for very small rockets. And I think it's about to open soon. But in the 70s and 80s, there was not a C launch pad. There's just A and B. Um, and the idea in the show is that they just they just mentioned it that there's about to be a shuttle taking off from L, from LC 39C, and uh, it, it's to say that the shuttle program is so successful that they have more launch pads at that one launch complex. And so if you're a space fan and you know the kind of the history there, those things will stand out as as, as neat trivia. You also see uh, in eighties a Tesla equivalent, <laughs> and you know things like that is entertaining. So it, it's it's it, it's oh yeah because yeah they released like a second like featurette trailer thing and there's like electric oh, cool. cars yeah 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 which in the range is like comical <laughs> like you know but it's 60 funny. miles yeah yeah um but so so yeah if you like season one i think this is it's the same show from the same creators uh okay. it's this the story continues and i i liked that about it so uh All right, and well, I, in a sec we can talk about you know you got your interviews and they got a cool, cool. ar thing uh, let's just do our last ad of the show. Sure. We're sponsored by LinkedIn Jobs. Make a fresh start for your small business this year with LinkedIn Jobs. Whether you're shifting business hours around or you're hiring remote employees, having the right people on your team is essential. And when your business is ready to make that next hire, LinkedIn Jobs can help by matching your role with qualified candidates so that you can find the right person for your business fast. And it's even better, your first job post is now free. LinkedIn is an active community of professionals with more than 722 million members worldwide. Begin by posting the job title, company name, and location. And new features make it even easier to get started. You can post a job with targeted screening questions attached that help to filter out the pool and get your job with more qualified candidates. So you don't have to worry and and you know rush rubbish through the piles of applications it's going to filter it down for you to make it so much quicker linkedin jobs screens candidates with the hard and soft skills that you're looking for and your job post is targeted to shut for people looking for a job just like yours put simply linkedin jobs can help you hire the right person faster and now you can also manage job posts and contact applicants from a single view on linkedin.com with everything laid out in a single streamlined dashboard and you can do all of this from your mobile device too, no matter where the day takes you. When your business is ready to make that crucial next hire, find the <laughs> Where did Mayo go? Uh oh. Let me send him a message and see what happened there. Where did you go? Question mark. I wonder if he lost power or something. You know, he's on a, on a notebook. <laughs> he's read the message. Where did you go? Red. Oh, here he comes. He's coming back. 
Hey, you want to reboot that? I was doing the ad read and I didn't even notice we'd left. Yeah, let's let's reboot the ad read just for the posterity. Let's do the ad read again, yeah? Yeah, yeah, it'll be quick. I've got to open it again now. Thanks, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was me. I leaned over a little bit and you were gone. That was pretty funny. Okay, make a fresh start for your small business with LinkedIn Jobs. Whether you're shifting business hours or hiring remote employees, having the right people on your team remains essential. When your business is ready to make that next hire, LinkedIn Jobs can help by matching your role with qualified candidates so you can find the right person for your business fast. And to make things even better, your first job post is now free with our URL. LinkedIn is an active community of professionals with more than 722 million members worldwide. Begin by posting the job title, company name, and location. And new features make it even easier to get started. You can post a job with targeted screening questions attached, which help filter the pool and get your job in front of more qualified candidates. LinkedIn Jobs screens candidates with the hard and soft skills that you're looking for. Your job post is targeted to show up for people looking for a job just like yours. Put simply, LinkedIn Jobs can help you hire the right person faster. And now you can also manage job posts and contact applicants from a single view on LinkedIn.com with everything laid out in a streamlined dashboard. And of course, you can do all of this too from your mobile device, iPhone or iPad, no matter where the day takes you. When your business is ready to make that crucial next hire, find the right person with LinkedIn Jobs. And now you can post a job for free. Just visit linkedin.com slash happy hour. Again, that's linkedin.com slash happy hour to post a job for free. Terms and conditions to apply. Our thanks to LinkedIn Jobs for sponsoring the show. Thanks, LinkedIn. Yeah, so uh, as I was saying, I, I also did interviews with some of the cast and creators from Frog Mankind. Um, and it was a really cool experience. It's the first time I've ever done something like that before. And um, I, I mentioned that in a previous episode, but now they're now they're published. Um, and I would promote like the things inside of them, but I haven't actually listened back to them besides doing a little bit of editing for the video. My plan was to listen through and transcribe and include his quotes in the in the article. Um, but then, because video is hard, but it turns out editing video uh, clips together and it is easier than transcribing and <laughs> and listening back to half an hour of interviews. So, um, so they're think, on the YouTube channel. So they're on the YouTube channel. I think I think it worked out well. Uh, and then uh, lastly, on for all mankind for this week at least, because uh, I guess next week will be a couple of days away from the, the season premiere. Uh, Apple has released their first augmented reality app connected to Apple TV Plus. So uh, this was reported as, as, as a rumor like last August or so uh, from Bloomberg that Apple was working on some kind of director's cut materials, some bonus materials for Apple TV Plus content. Um, and the first version of it is, is, is For All Mankind Time Capsule. And it is an iPhone and iPad app, uses AR kit. There's even a couple of uh, parts of it that require the LiDAR sensor on the iPad Pro. And That's iPhone. why they added the LiDAR scanner. Yeah. Apple TV Plus bonus content. <laughs> all, all, all that time. And the iPhone 12 Pro and iPhone 12 Pro Max. Uh, and what the app is, it, it's the, the name kind of suggests what it is. It, it's Time Capsule. Um, you're the character. Apple's making uh, roots again? I, I, you know, this is the comeback. I, I, wish, I wish it were so. That, this is the alternative. This is the alternative timeline. Uh, aspect Does it back of it. up all your iCloud uh, account information to a local it, disk? It's like iCloud for your Mac. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> that would be amazing. Uh, no, it's it's set in the it's set between the two decades. So I think for all mankind, season one ended in in the you know, early seventies. I early think seventies. Yeah. Yeah. And this picks up in the early '80s, and so it's 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 the character Danny Stevens, who's the son of uh, Gordon Stevens and Tracy Stevens, both astronauts. Um, it, it's it's some of his teenage years because he's he's a character who's in season two, sort of prominently versus being you know a kid in the background in the first season, um, based on that decade jump. And um, you, you know, it, it's a it's a cool AR demonstration. You're going through a kind of a box of trinkets, and, and there's some storytelling involved. There's um, theme music. They have the same person who made the, the same composer who made the music for the show do the under music for the for the app. Um, there's some some music like some Bob Dylan licensed to kind of put it in the in the time that it's in. And um, and it's AR kit, so it looks cool and it works well. <laughs> and and there's some some keys on the screen that you interact with where you like slice open a cookie or you know open this 
envelope, that kind of thing. There's, there's no a little, Mac. I was going to say, there's a little bit of an Apple cameo. Uh, this happens in the season as well, where the Apple II makes an appearance as like the computer of the day in the 80s. Uh, and, and that's normal. But what's not normal is that uh, there's email. And they call it D-mail for digital mail. <laughs> and they say it's a predecessor to email. Um, but I, and that makes sense. I mean, email. Okay, I, I get it. D mail because uh, D comes before E. <laughs> yeah, D's before E. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, you know, that's what happens when this base program flourishes. I suppose is that you get D mail before you get email. Uh, so okay. What are they um, gonna have but, next? The N phone. <laughs> Wait, that N doesn't come before I. I've just messed it that doesn't. Right up. It really the K phone. K phone. <laughs> no, that's not. Wait, why can't I do the alphabet today? J K. Um, H it's I, H, H, isn't it? It's H, H yeah. H I, yeah. H, yeah. H phone. Yeah. There we go. H, H, H phone. <laughs> you nailed that joke. Yeah, that one really uh, felt bad. <laughs> yeah, but anyway, the app is available. It's in the U.S. only. I think. I think people are saying it's in the U.K. as well now. Um, it's going to be available in more markets soon. They say, but uh, it, it's interesting. I mean, they 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 had a little bit of a panel discussion with Ron Moore, um, the show creator, and he he said something that was interesting, which is that. The, the newscast that they use in the show and in, in For All Mankind, you know, they're obviously fictitious new, you know, newsreels, um, but they, they, they write a bunch of those. And that's one of his favorite things as a history buff. And they only get to use a few because otherwise it would be a show about newscast. And um, this was a way to recycle some of those because there's a newscast in the app experience. And he likes, he likes those. So this was a way to, to use that. Um, I ask if there's gonna be more of these, you know, for season two as it's available or future seasons. And the answer was really, we'll see how it goes, how reception is with this one. So I guess if it's a dud, no, <laughs> but if it's popular, yes. And, and, and putting it in more markets in the U S will certainly help. Um, and, and you don't have to have seen any of the seasons to really enjoy the app. Cause it's, it's a cool demonstration of AR anyway. Yeah, it's like, cool. Right? Like, even if for all mankind didn't exist, it's just a cool little thing to play around with. Right. It's like an AR demo. It's like playing yep. table tennis or whatever. Mm-hmm. Like, like my comment is like it's cool bonus content, right? But mm-hmm. if it's like because it's 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 not in, it's not in, it's not integrated into the actual TV app, it's just like you have to go download it from the app store, right? I, and right, and I imagine at some point they'll promote it, <laughs> but right now it's you know the the press got a link to it, and then you read the press story and click the link to it. Uh, I was looking before the show, and without without reading my story to find that I couldn't find it on the app store yet. Maybe that changes as they promote it. Yeah, but it's, apps- it's listed under Apple's developer account at least. So okay, yeah. that's helpful. But like. What you need to have is like in the TV app, when you scroll down to the bit where it says bonus content, there needs to be, as well as the little, you know, extra videos they have there, it needs to have a link to the AR experience. Or yeah. when you like finish an episode, so you've watched, you know, you've watched, you finish the season even, right? You finish season one of For Mankind. Yeah. And then they should have, look, now you can enjoy this extra AR experience. It's like the special features on a DVD, right? Like it has to be integrated into the thing you're watching. Like, Apple has Apple's done a bit of this already with you know various kinds of multimedia bonus content. They've done wallpapers for Ted Lasso. They've done um, iMessage sticker packs for Dickinson and Snoopy in space. But they tweet about them once and then they're gone forever. Like yeah. they, they're on the, st- the, the the sticker packs aren't even listed to Apple's developer account. They're made by some third party company and they're just listed. So you're never literally never going to find them, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, at least the For All Mankind one is under Apple's account, so that's an improvement. But they need to be like actually integrated into the tv experience and it doesn't need to be like you know annoying or just in the way but maybe you know in the run-up to for mankind season two on the little like if you've watched for mankind before it could give you a little notification it's like you know get ready for season two enjoy the ar experience a little or you or afterwards you just finish an episode and it's like okay now you've enjoyed this you could watch the next episode right now or why don't you try this on your phone or you know mm-hmm. Or in, if you've finished Dickinson, you know, now go and share it with your friends and tweet tweet us and show us, you know, sticker packs and stuff. Like, it, yep. the, doing the extra bonus content things are good. Even the even the wallpapers, like the Ted Lasso was a great idea. But that needs to be, like, in the TV app so you can scroll down, see the wallpapers, and then, you know, from within the TV app, set the wallpaper, right? Like, not this thing where it's like, oh, we're just going to upload these photos to Twitter in the right form- file format. So not only do you have to, like, see the tweet once when they ship it, then you have to save the image to your photo library and then set it as your wallpaper. Like, you know, you've got to do all the steps put together. And the thing that worries me when they say, oh, we'll see how the reception is and if we do more or not. Well, obviously, if you're never going to promote the things or you're never going to actually have integrated the core experience, they're never going to be popular. Like, you have to do, it's chicken and egg, right? You've got to do the, you've got to do the work up front to, to integrate it all together. 
Yeah, a little, a little bit concerning there. Uh, and I would have cool. asked, I would have asked how they planned to promote it, but it was the share creators, not Apple. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> what are they gonna say? Uh, and they they were happy that it's you know it's on Apple's platform with with the, you know a, a billion potential users. Um, so so that's neat. And I actually haven't checked out. The, I haven't used the app yet because um, in in the couple of hours I had access to the, to the story before uh, it came available. Um, we we were just shown the demonstration of it, but not the not uh, able to use the app. So, um, because it requires lidar for at least one or two scenes in the app experience, um, I'm I'm looking forward to that because there aren't a lot of things that require lidar. <laughs> if you just want a good example of the lidar sensor on my iPad or iPhone, you know, at, at work, uh, this is this is one sure way to do that. So, um, looking forward to trying that out. Um, so I think also wanted to mention this week is a, a movie that Apple has purchased for Apple TV Plus called Dolly. Have you seen this story? I've seen the story. Yeah, yeah. Um, I can't actually remember what happens, but no, they 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 acquired the rights to a package uh, of a movie called Dolly. Um, and the 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 concept of the movie is basically uh, it's a robotic assistant that's standing trial in court. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and and it's it, not about Dolly Parton because when originally I saw the headline, it's going to be a Dolly Parton biography. Yeah, because they've had so much stuff with her. They've got the Shazam yeah. news. They've got the time to walk thing. But it's it's not it's it's I mean I get, and I guess the name is like a doll but it's a robot you know it's mm-hmm. kind of a play on that uh, I I just <laughs> it it sounds weird um it just it stood out to me as something different that's coming have you ever seen I Robot the uh, Will Smith mm-hmm. movie mm-hmm. sort of like on along those lines kind of a little yeah is it that the, that the robot kills someone though and then it's like I didn't do it or something. <laughs> Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is this is from our story. Dolly is a sci-fi drama inspired by uh, inspired by Elizabeth, Elizabeth Bear's story in which a robotic doll kills its owner and shocks the world by asking for a lawyer, claiming she's not guilty. Um, the film has elements of both classic courtroom drama and sci-fi. So just said as weird. <laughs> I mean, maybe it'll be really interesting and different. It's like defending Jacob, but with robots. Sure. Yeah. Def- it, it's definitely. I'm down. I like I like courtroom dramas and I like sci-fi. So if they could do it well, it'd be cool. Good. Yeah. All right. We'll see how it goes. Um, and then uh, there's news of we've we've been discussing the Apple TV three, the third generation Apple TV that Apple sold for a hundred dollars for a few years, and then for six million dollars at the very end of its life um, for a few months. And we discussed last week or so when this box lost access to YouTube, or it's going to be losing access to YouTube in March. It'll be AirPlay only for you know probably the biggest app on the platform. Um, and, and obviously, Apple has the Apple TV four and five, the HD and the four K versions now, and they've been out for a long time. They're also long in the tooth. <laughs> They're also long in the tooth. Uh, but the, the latest uh, casualty on Apple TV three is CBS All Access. Uh, users of that box will no longer have access to that, and it will be AirPlay only. So that's one more for Apple TV three. With with, I think your point is a good one, and that there's no clear replacement for the hundred dollars streaming box, or if you pay seventy dollars for it, even that price, you've got to look at, um, you know, thirty five dollars streaming sticks as, as their replacement. Apple just doesn't have a replacement in this in this category yet. Yeah, and and when you know the Apple TV three is still used by millions of people, when the little notifications pop up on your screen saying YouTube's going to stop working in March, CBS is going to stop working in March, do you think they're blaming YouTube? Do you think they're blaming CBS? <laughs> are they going to blame Apple? Like, so not only are they furious at Apple for intentionally making their hardware obsolete or that's at least how they see it right like technically it's a bit common like this all stems from the fact that the third gen apple, apple tv never had an app store right so right. all these all these things cool. are just stuck in this basically the firmware of what they had back in the day so they when they do big major new initiatives they never get they never move it's, it's like the feature phone equivalent of a streaming box yeah it's kind of like the old ipods right like where mm-hmm. they just kind of like they ship this is what they have and then slowly the stuff doesn't work anymore yeah um and that was a mistake of Apple. They should have done an app store on the Apple TV way before 2015 when they did it the, the original Apple TV and they wouldn't be in this problem. But hey, here we are. Especially um, when they have like so many and you could only, you could show or hide, you couldn't uh, like remove or add. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like, and now it's even worse because people are mad. They're like, oh, you know, you're making, you're making my box worse. And then they go and look at buying another one. They're like, $150? This is ridiculously expensive because they remember buying it for 100 or 60 or whatever. And so they go and buy a Fire Stick, very understandably. So it's just a bad situation all around. Mm-hmm. Yep. Um, and also CBS All Access related. Um, a few months ago, there was this really nice bundle that if you subscribe to Apple TV Plus, 
um, then you can have you can purchase a bundle from CBS that has CBS All Access and Showtime for ten dollars a month. And so I, th I think CBS All Access is ten dollars a month on its own. So you basically got Showtime at no extra cost. Yeah, and Showtime's were, like ten dollars as well. Mm -hmm, yeah. yeah. So if you are an Apple TV Plus subscriber, so it's pretty clever. You know, it makes you want to be an Apple TV Plus subscriber, or if you already are, it's a reward, it's a treat. Um, and for me, I paid for both Apple TV Plus. And CBL, CBS All Access, so it was a no-brainer to do, to opt into the bundle because then I get Showtime at no additional cost. Um, that bundle went away, and it's not it's not weird why like there's, there's Paramount Plus coming to replace CBS All Access as yeah. their streaming service versus you know a, a, a kind of a back catalog of CBS stuff, some of the new stuff, and then you know a few originals. So it's going to be kind of goes from being a channel to being a whole service of its own. And so it makes sense that the bundle goes away. It, it is funny though that for me, I never got to actually pay for Apple TV Plus because the free trial's been extended so many times that you know the idea of the bundle is you pay for Apple TV Plus and you, one of the two things, and you get the other one for free. Um, it's just been I paid for ten dollars a month for CBS Access, and I got you know the other things just showed up there. So, uh, <laughs> but it's, it's too bad. Um, but you, you, your your hunch is that we we probably won't because CBS All Access is, it can be a channel in Apple TV. Um, so I mean, Showtime yeah. can be a channel that you, you subscribe through Apple TV um, directly or through Apple TV and you don't have to you know, do a, a subscription through the other app or anything and it plays directly in the app. Um, it's a very good experience, but your hunch is that that's going to go away because Paramount Plus, because it's kind of Netflix level, it won't be a channel within Apple TV. It'll be its own service. Yeah, remote, we saw this happen last year with HBO, right? Like HBO was, you know, like the flagship Apple TV channel. And then when they launched HBO Max, they removed the channel and now no one new can actually sign up to HBO through Apple TV channels. You get the app integration in HBO Max, so it shows up in up next. But when you actually want to go and watch something, you then get yoinked out the TV app and you have to go into the HBO Max experience. It's really annoying. Like You just want to be able to watch everything in one place. And the TV app doesn't let you do that unless you're... Uh, either watching Apple mm -hmm. Apple content or channels content. And yeah, my favorite thing about channels is on the Mac, there's not a lot of apps. I mean, if you have an M1 Mac, you're not going to have a good HBO experience and you're yep. not going to have a CBS All Access app at all. Um, same for Showtime. So by doing Apple TV channels, it's in the TV app and you can save it. You can offline you know, download it and it's a good experience. Works with picture in picture. There's not a web browser involved and that goes away whenever there's not you can't pay through channels. Yeah, and it's a consistent UI that's with everything else you're using, right? Like, it's not like, you know, a load of different silos. Uh, but unfortunately, due to everyone wanting to, like, you know, make their stand with their own services, uh, Apple TV channels are going away as fast as channels on the third generation Apple TV are. <laughs> like, they're just dropping like flies, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. And this one was the result of a, a promotional deal between Apple that they literally made a press release about, right? Like, a huge yeah. deal. And that and the, it's going to last five months because that was August. And yeah it's gonna be going away so it's kind of a stupid situation but yeah it's sad like i don't know what they're gonna do with the tv app because at the moment like it's like the place for everything put into one place but it doesn't make you a good experience you don't get netflix at all and all the channels are just disappearing so they might as well just make it like apple tv the apple app, tv app yeah yeah the apple the actual apple tv app not yeah. like an, a, an aggregator thing i don't know yeah like, I, I i think i agree with that yeah. uh unfortunately there's a but there are a bunch of small channels that are never going to go away like Smithsonian yeah. and, and you know the nickelodeon thing and stuff like that um oh well <laughs> Um, last thing I want to mention this week before we go away is um, because it affects, I think you, your Mac could be affected, is this MacBook Pro battery replacement program for the 2016 and 2017 models. Is, is yours affected because you've got a 2016? Mine is a 2016. My battery seems to be okay. 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 Well, okay. The... okay in how it has been because obviously it's now four years old so the battery's really depleted. So if you actually unplug it, it only lasts for about an hour off on, on battery. But this this is not exhibiting the problem that this replacement program describes which, which is that it, the battery can't charge past one percent is that yeah right? yeah it's, that's a problem good thing they've got a replacement program you know when the M, m1 mac has has battery wear over four years it's gonna be like you only get like five hours of battery yeah you only get five hours <laughs> what a shame. <laughs> this is a really funny bug though because it's like if you get afflicted by it you have to send your laptop physically into apple to get it fixed but if you haven't been affected by it yet, Apple says you can just update to 11.2.1 .1 and you won't be affected by it. Uh, which you, I presume we did. I've done that, yeah. So, so when you get ready like, to... A software bug causes a permanent hardware fault. 
bricks your battery. <laughs> yeah, and 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 so if you so if your battery was stuck at one percent and you update to eleven point two point one, it would still be stuck at one percent. That's why. So you have to have a it's a hardware problem to cover up a software fault. I, they don't say the reason for it. I have to assume there was some like weird logic error with the optimized battery charging stuff because they introduced that on the map pretty recently, right? Like mm-hmm. it's got to be something to do with that. And then you know it sent a weird message down to the battery controller that doesn't let it charge past one percent. So then they have to go and like. They don't specify exactly what's wrong with it. It just says, you know, there's an experience with the battery not charging. I assume when they take it into Apple and get it fixed, they're probably not replacing the battery. They're probably replacing, like, you know, the little microcontroller that, like, char- you know, is in charge of powering the battery or charging the battery, right? That'd be my guess. But new, it's a just new battery of, would be nice, though. I mean, yeah. Four year old machine. <laughs> yeah. I mean, this, this, don't worry. I've had plenty of replacement programs I am eligible for or was eligible for, yeah. like the butterfly keyboard situation, which is now because that was that was that was four years, wasn't it? They gave you four years to get mm-hmm. that fixed. So I'm now firmly outside the window of that. <laughs> when they say don't buy first generation products, like the, the 2016 MacBook Pro is that example. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's like this battery, like this one percent battery charger thing, is like the smallest footnote on the list of problems yeah. with the 2016 MacBook Pro. Yeah. Um, all right. Nice. Um, thanks everyone who tuned in live to listen on youtube.com slash nf 5 mac and on uh, Facebook as well. Uh, and if you enjoy the show and you don't subscribe already, we, we are in Apple Podcast, Overcast, Spotify, Google Podcasts, maybe. And uh, we, we appreciate you subscribing and joining us back every week. Um, we, we broadcast live on Thursdays at 4 p.m. Eastern time. Um, and uh, And you can follow us in the Apple Podcast app now. Yeah, that's a that's a new feature that's coming in the beta version after the, it's out of beta. Subscribe becomes follow, which gives you room to subscribe monetarily in a different way. Exactly. <laughs> in a different yeah. way, or it's just maybe it's just a friendly way of doing it. But uh, anyway, uh, if you have any feedback for the show, you can email both of us together at happy hour at podcast at nine. What, what is it now? What's the email? Isn't it just happy hour nine five dot com? Probably. Yeah, yeah. That's 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 it. Well, definitely, definitely works. It used to be different. It's been happy hour at nineformat.com for so long. I know. I need lunch or something. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, and you can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at Apollo Zach Benjamin. You're on Twitter at BZA Mayo. And we will be back next week. Bye, everybody. Bye bye.